Okay, everyone. Happy Wednesday, December 8th. And we are back at it again. And I want to thank Crystal Waters for her great interview last week. Very insightful, amazing, powerful, and educational. Being one of the first feminine house icon artists to have a record go from underground house music to cross over to pop music early in the game. But here we go. Welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. And I'm so glad that every week, the last few weeks, I've been having women. I'm so proud to bring these women on. And this week, I'm bringing on a great DJ from the new school, Powerful. She was just telling me she's in Los Angeles, and thankfully she was able to set up her internet, and we were trying to track her down. Where are you? Where are you? She finally found her way to an internet Wi-Fi stable connection. She came on. She's actually all set up. She put herself properly. You'll see in a second. This DJ is the DJ to the stars. I'll tell you why I say that, because she's worked. She's actually hung out with Lady Gaga, played for Rihanna. It's crazy. She's going to tell you all about this stuff as well. And Jazzy Jeff, you all know Jazzy Jeff with the, you know, and the Fresh Prince, Will Smith, says he said she is one of the best female DJs he's ever seen. So on that note, that's enough of endorsement for me. <laughs> and on that note, I'd like to welcome the True House Stories DJ. Caper. I made it. I made it. <laughs> you made it, girl. You made it. Yes. I can't believe it. Like, I've just been running around, like we were saying backstage. I've been running around for, so, for like a month now. And um, yeah, I'm sorry. If the Wi Fi connection is rubbish, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm in the hotel. Right <laughs> now, I'm sorry. You're doing good. You're doing good. So, you're in Los Angeles right now. So yeah. You can tell us what you're doing right now. I'm not going to tell you. You could tell the people what you're up to. So what are you doing? You're, you're in, you, are you trying out for a picture? Are you going into the Hollywood scene? scene? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> I'm doing a uh, stream today for Facebook Gaming um, with LPGOB. And we basically DJ while a bunch of gamers, like, and I play Halo or something, um, <laughs> or Crash Bandicoot or one of those. I used to play Crash Bandicoot back in the day. Um, so yeah, they basically game and then we play the music and then we, I, I guess that's it. <laughs> that's what we do. That's why I'm here, just to play music. And how long is this set? Is it a whole day thing or is it just? No, it's, um, I, I, do you know what? I don't even know what time it is right now. I think... They're going to be uh, ringing her bell. They're going to be ringing the bell in a minute. you got to go down in five minutes. And say, okay, show everyone. Take care, everyone. Caper has came on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's um, at 3 p.m. L.A. time. So I'm not sure what time that is anywhere else. But, yeah. Okay, so 3 o'clock L.A. time. Yeah. If you go to Facebook Gaming, then I'll be DJing. So everyone, 3 o'clock Los Angeles time is 6 o'clock New York time, 11 p.m. UK time, everyone. That's it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You're all right. We're in the clear. Thankfully, she didn't do a double booking with us. So before I get into the first question, I know you were mentioning, I, I, I don't like to bring this up. But I'm going to bring it up. I know COVID's been tough, but you're actually now getting ready to go back to the United Kingdom, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. For the first time in, like, since before COVID, last time I was there was, like, the February before this all started. And I just, every, every time I... Tried to go back to London, it was like something happened or like, you know, there's restrictions or it's like you had to quarantine for two weeks. So just didn't end up going back and I haven't seen like my family for like two years. So I'm going back for the first time in two years on Saturday. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of, it's going to be weird. It's like, I can't believe two years have passed. It's crazy. Um, 
being that I hear this English accent, are you a Londoner or you are you outside? No, no, no. I'm from London. I'm proper London. <laughs> I'm from South London. Um, I'm from a place called Croydon. <gasps> which oh, um, I know Croydon, uh, Crystal Palace. Yeah, yeah, play Croydon. Oh. <laughs> I know Croydon. Yeah, that's my team. So I live like around the corner from Crystal Palace, uh, from Selhurst Stadium. So yeah, that's where I'm from. <laughs> Okay, so I was right. I wasn't sure if it was the Croydon accent or not, but it's got a bit of <laughs> clean. It's Brooklynized, everyone. You know what? Don't say that. Am I losing my accent? Not Am yet. I losing no. my accent? Yeah, yeah. No, no, darling, you're not losing the accent yet. No, <laughs> no, no. Actually, you still have it. <laughs> but what will happen, like everyone that lives in New York, you mm -hmm. can assimilate. And you'll get, hey, oh, get away from my car. <laughs> <laughs> you see? Yo, you, use guys, move yeah. back off the shit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, all right. I'm going to, I have to check myself sometimes because I started saying, like, trash can and, like, things Oh, like no that. rubbish? Oh, oh, the rubbish cans. No, you don't say the rubbish. No, we, we say rubbish or the bin. And I'm, and recently I've been like, oh, can you go put this in the trash to my husband? And he's like, what did you just say? <laughs> oh, he's English as well, right? No, no, no. He's he's American, but he's like waiting for me to, to <laughs> get the American accent. And I'm like, oh, my God. But here's what happens, right? Because I, I, whenever I go home, it's like a switch. It's like all of a sudden I'm like South London, very cockney, like... I don't care. Bubble and squeak on Sunday. Everything goes back to the English way, right? Everything. Like, like once I'm around other English people, then I'm like, ah, rah, 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 you know, like, I'm... Oi, oi, oi. Yeah, like... <laughs> All right, everyone. We know now for sure she is quite posh. But <laughs> she's getting scrubbed out with Brooklyn. Let's just put it like this. Williamsburg type of mentality mm -hmm. <laughs> Williamsburg, oh my god all right all right well thank you again for coming on i want to get right to question because i know you got you have something great to share with us and and it's important to hear all our feminine heroes of the game tell their stories and of course we want to get a little insight of how you found the music or the music found you the younger Caper. Yeah, um, it, that's a good question because I'm not actually sure it just happened, right? Like, um, anyone in the UK would know this. Like, we're just surrounded by so many different styles of music. Like, you grow up and, like, our pop charts are, like, we're, like, there's, like, a drum and bass song. There's, like, a house song. There's, like, all, you know, it is a part of our culture. So, so music just kind of was a part of me um i um had a couple of older cousins who were djs and they were like hip-hop djs back in the day like they used to dj all around the uk or whatever and i would look up to them and like i you know kind of wanted to be like them i was definitely never like a girly girl so i always wanted to like be with like my older cousins like guy cousins or like my brother who's like seven years older than me so like you know I was definitely influenced by them um and whatever they were listening to so yeah it's just just it just I guess I guess the answer is music just found me I don't know um, so were you were you consider yourself like into more hip-hop or were you into the dance sound that was going on at the younger kid version of hearing your brother and his friends I would say that the foundation would always, my foundation musically is, will always come from hip hop, right? Um, like 90s hip hop, because that's the era that I grew up in or whatever. But at the same time, like I said, like in the UK, like we had so many other different like genres of music that were like so influential, like drum and bass, like house music, for example, like classic house music, was in our like charts do you know what i mean like in our top 40 charts when i was growing up 
and it wasn't like an underground thing it was like you know even like french disco like you know things like that like that's it was it was it was a part of just growing up and i didn't realize it until i left until i moved like or until i started traveling to dj and stuff like that like i didn't realize how um how influential like my uh my musical history growing up in the uk was to me so you know um but yeah i i think the foundation will always start from hip-hop for me okay yeah so where does this begin for you from being the young kid and becoming starting to dj who was the one that you've seen or who was the one that inspired you to play music yeah so like i said like i um i like a few of my cousins um uh were djs and so i was kind of influenced by them but also i was always just curious about djing like i used to play the drums when i was in school um and i just kind of like it's a weird thing to describe but like because i played the drums i just knew that i knew how to dj because i could hear exactly what i needed to do like i just knew like how to match beats before i could even do it so my older brother when he was trying to dj he's not a dj he was trying to dj and he like he borrowed my cousin's decks for like a weekend or whatever and I remember coming home from school and just being like, okay, yeah, I'll just do that. And like, I had a couple of records and I mixed them together. And he was like, how did you do that? Like, what? And I was like, I don't know. I just did it. I don't know. But I, I always had an understanding of uh, beat matching from such a young age that it came so naturally to me. So I was like, oh, I'm good at this. And I was never really, I wasn't one of those kids that was like good at like school or like good at anything right so when i found something that was good i was like oh my god okay this is what i should say to you. um so yeah so and then i just kind of i'm i became obsessed with it kind of a little bit and um i uh started watching like the Technics DMC videos when i was like younger and i wanted to be like a scratch dj and i picked up very quick um, I, I used to, like, when I was very young, um, there was, like, um, do you know, um, uh, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, he's the DJ, I'm the rapper, that album, so my cousin had left it in my, in my house somewhere, and I remember having that tape, and, and it didn't even have the cover or anything, and I put it in, into the tape, uh, and I played it, and it went to, um, the track live from Union Square. And it was right at the moment where Will Smith asked uh, Jazzy Jeff, like, show them the transform scratch. And then I was like, oh my God, like, what is this? I have to learn this. So I would basically, I was obsessed over that part of the track and I would play, rewind, play, rewind until, and I would try and emulate what he was doing until I thought that it was the right thing or whatever um and yeah I, that's how that's basically how i became a dj it's just like trial and error basically so so to make it clear everyone she started with techniques 1200s and vinyl not yes. a single yeah. not a no, single no, no, no. no i'm a lot older than i look <laughs> no i want them to understand that that they know that you're not a little kid you know that you're older than what no, 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 no. i i started djing like, I would say, like, I started DJ maybe, like, 1996. Um, and, yeah, for a, for a good amount of, like, my career, I had to buy vinyl. And I had turntables. And I have a whole record collection back home in London that I couldn't bring here. But, because <laughs> um, there's too many. But, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much, yeah. <laughs> you became the transforming queen, huh? Mm hmm I did, and I didn't even have, like, a good mix up. Did they give you a tag name, like Miss Transformer or something? They tag you? Like, you know. No, see, my tag name was Caper, 
with, on the London buses. Well, let's get Cooper. that name. How does that name come together? Caper, the tag. <laughs> ah. So it's like a childhood nickname that I got when I was at school. So when, you know, after school or whatever, you get on the bus, like the red London buses and, you know, all the, all the kids would go home and we would always go to the back of the bus and all the bad kids would start tagging and on the back of the bus um and my friends were like you should be called caper because i was very i got into a lot of trouble at school always suspended every single year i got suspended like five or six times no way you look too sweet to be suspended no, but it wasn't like bad stuff it was like stupid stuff like i i would like just know how to like stand up for myself like if if a teacher was like talking crap to me or whatever i'd be like what you know like i just knew um and then i get into trouble and i'd always be in the headmistress's office so well, i was gonna say that did you hear the microphone go like this huh? was- come down to the yeah. headmaster's office <laughs> there was a desk in front of the headmistress's office and everyone knew that they were just always going to see me there and i would never did anything really that bad i just no, would always like stick up for myself. So no, you didn't do nothing wrong. No, no, no. I did it. I did. I swear. Um, so anyway, so I yeah, I used to. So they gave me the name Caper because I was mischievous. I guess not. Yeah, I was a bit, little bit mischievous. I would always like do stupid things. Like I don't know. Like I, I shouldn't say this. I'm not gonna tell you. No, I should tell you. No, I'm not gonna tell you. Wait, should I tell you? Hold it's on. true how stories you have to tell us. We've heard people went to jail for certain things on <laughs> major <laughs> stuff. There's nothing that you can tell us is that that heavy. Please. So, do you remember? Okay, so you remember? Like, I got the name Caper because I used to tag the London buses at the back, right? So you know, like sometimes, occasionally, I would tag the teachers' cars with permanent marker. <laughs> Cool. I'm not proud of it. Cool. I'm not proud of it now that I am 38 years old. I she's think a grown up, everyone, and she's telling she's not endorsing it, but she is telling you she was a mischievous child at one time. I was, yes. I was a very mischievous child. So that's that's basically where Oh my god. Be- we just almost fell off our chairs like like it was like the word whoa. She tagged the teachers' cars, everyone. I thought you lit the place on fire or something. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. No, that's, look, you know what? No, but we're like with permanent marker. You know, like she had to get a fucking, sorry, am I allowed to swear? Sorry. It's all right. Um, <laughs> she had to get her car spray painted again because of, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Did they actually know, like, they had you on, they just had you on a watch just to keep an eye on her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was it was so funny. I remember when I did that, they called an assembly and the headmistress was looking right at me. Like she knew it was me. And she was like, someone in this room tagged the science teacher's car. Who was it? And they were just she was just looking straight at me and everyone was like and I was like, if you say anything, if you say anything, I swear to God. It was it was her. <laughs> it was me. Wait, wait. It was me. her med mistress. I'm sorry. But you know what? You know what? They couldn't prove it because no one ratted me out. So it's oh wow. You must wow, you must have been very, very well liked in your class. Um yes, maybe. <laughs> so that actually tells me that speaking on a male Sorry, that you we would say you have a big pair of balls. <laughs> yes. In other words, like you you take you take risks mm-hmm. knowing those risks can can get you in major trouble. Yes. But you're willing to take the risk. Mm-hmm. 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 And honestly, that's what I've done pretty much my whole life up until now. Um it's just go with it. Just take risks, go with it. You know. All right, so now let's go back to school. So when you're in school, of course, you know, you live in school, you're going, you said, I didn't really do that well with school. What were you thinking you were going to be doing as a profession per not this DJ thing? So let's be real for a second when you're younger. 
It looks so like- it's crazy. So what's crazy is like probably from when I was like maybe six or eight years old, I knew that I wanted to do something in music. I just didn't know what it was. So like, for example, like I would like see a recording studio like where you are right now and I'd be like, oh, my God, all those buttons. And I wouldn't know what it was, but I knew that I wanted to do something that involved that. So I, I'm i not one of those kids who's like, oh, I, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be an astronaut or blah, blah, blah. Like, like, I legit wanted to do something in music. I just didn't know what. And, and um, yeah, and then when I got a little bit older, I actually wanted – to be a producer. I never wanted to be a DJ. I wanted to produce music. And actually still to this day, I am still uh, like, I I think the DJing took over a little bit more than, you know, because it involves me traveling and like, you know, whatever. Um, But producing is like my main focus. That's all I've ever wanted to do, which is crazy to think about like after all these years because it's like you're you're asking me like you know what did you want to do when you were a kid like that's what I wanted to do never once thought about being like a DJ maybe until a little bit later um but yeah I just didn't know what it was in music I didn't know what like all those buttons did but I was like I want to be a producer whatever (laughs) that means something interesting you mentioned you said I'm I was a drummer and mm-hmm. I understood beat matching. Were you playing with any bands or you were just drumming for yourself? Um, so like, you know, like at school, like, you know, they encourage you to learn instruments or whatever. So I was just learning with the drum teacher. So I would have like classes and then I would play in the school band or whatever. Um, and that was it really. Um, but I was, I never thought that I was like, I always like, wanted to be like really amazing like I wanted to be little John Roberts I wanted to be Questlove do you know what I mean at the drums and I wasn't that do you know what I mean so when I figured out that I could DJ I was like right that's that that's what I okay cool that's what I'm gonna do you know what I mean that's what I'm gonna like practice with and it was just so easy for me because I had the knowledge of of uh, beats and timing and stuff from drumming so so yeah um that's how that happened. <laughs> okay, so that sets that sets me up to the next question. Yeah. How do you take it from the bedroom and make it into a profession for yourself? Where are these yeah. um so so when I uh so you know like I was I was you know how you see on Instagram you see the the little kids now they're like you know turntablists and they're really amazing I was doing that except there was no social media there was no Instagram no one had camera phones like whatever I was that kid right so when I was like 16 um you know like I had already been DJing for so long I had already like been you know, practicing at home and like doing all the things. And when I was 16, um, I started DJing like in clubs and I had to be chaperoned by my brother because I wasn't old enough technically. So I was an 18. So my brother would come with me, carry my records for me and I would DJ at clubs. And, and, uh, my first like residency, I was like 17 and it was at Ministry of Sound. And so how does someone like you at 17, what did you do to get that residency? I have no idea. Look, come on now. You gotta I remember. Have no idea. What do you do? I just have... open the papers and say, oh, I'm gonna oh, they're looking for a resident. I'm just gonna jump in and just do it. I think I think like a friend was like promoting or whatever, like and there's the in at ministry of sound there's three rooms so you have like the baby box you have the bar and then you have the main room and i remember my friend at the time was like oh i'm promoting ministry of sound i was like oh my god amazing yes i'll do it and it was like a student night on like a wednesday and i i started djing there and the person that was the booker for the whole venue saw me DJ and she was like, 
hey, I want you here like all the time, like after she saw me DJ. So then I became like a resident in the baby box. And then eventually, um, like when I was 18, I went to university and, you know, just kind of just kept progressing uh, just as I did. Like, you, like you, you know this, back in the day, everything was, is, was word of mouth. You know, like it was like, hey, I know this girl, like oh, I know this guy or whatever is really good. It wasn't like, oh, you didn't have to like have, you know, videos and this and that and like, or, you know, you would do a mix. There was no and, like, such thing as algorithms yet. There was yeah. no such things as followers. There was no That's such it. things as how many friends do you know and all that nonsense. No, none of that. It was all about word of mouth. And honestly, it was just because of word of mouth that I kept falling into the right, you know, path, I guess. Um, and yeah, that's, I just, so let's say this now, the first gig, your first professional gig, you know, the, you told me the promoter was really happy with you. Was it nerve wracking for you? And did it work out to the way you expected? Or did you yeah. have to, Oh Jesus. I'm like, Oh my God, this is like playing on a big sound system. This is totally different. You know, absolutely terrible so <laughs> so firstly uh like you know first time i dj'd in a club i was 16 years old i look young now can you imagine what i looked like when i was 16 right so i went up to the club and and then firstly the bouncer wouldn't let me in because he was like who the, who the hell are you and everyone in the line knew that I was like a DJ, but like this, the, the bouncer didn't, so he wouldn't let me in. And then everyone was like, let her in, let her in. And it was like very embarrassing. Anyway, eventually got in and then realized that not every DJ booth is built to my height, right? So I, I had to like, I had to like ask, um, ask for like a milk crate to stand on. And I was like, oh, my God, this is terrible. So wait, wait, wait. So wait, when you got there, was the turntables like this? Where were they? Like this? <laughs> the turntables were like literally up there, right? And I was like, what do you want me to do here? This is ridiculous. And, you know, do you remember like back in the day, like they didn't like, like DJ booths were not made very like, you know, it, they weren't made smartly. Like it was everything was fixed in. You couldn't like, you know, you couldn't adjust things the way you wanted everything was the way like it was all fixed in right so i was like oh my god i don't i have no idea what to do here um so this guy brings over a, a milk crate for me to stand on i stand on the milk crate i'm like grabbing my records like i didn't know what i was like this is completely different to me just djing at home in my brother's bedroom do you know what i mean like i was like where's the monitor the monitor is like somewhere else i'm like oh my god this is terrible so yeah it was, it was the worst experience but you know i figured it out <laughs> see that's what i try to tell everybody everybody has that first night when they go oh my god this was horrific i don't yeah. believe how bad it went but mm -hmm. you seem to get through it mm -hmm. somehow right you find a way yeah exactly so you're not that tall i'm already presuming we're presuming that you're I'm on the like short five, i'm five foot so okay that's fine so you know what on your rider i know you hit you probably tell them you need a staging setup so that you can have yourself a bit higher <laughs> yes exactly well actually on my rider now like there's actually like uh it tells you like what the height of the, the yeah right you need to right you need to have either that or they have to build you a box of yes. platform for you to go up exactly. so you can step up and then... didn't have that luxury when i was 16 that's for sure <laughs> Oh, for a very long time. I just had to fi figure it out. There's been times when I've had to, like, stand on my bag because no one, like, like I don't know what to do or whatever. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'll, if I stand on the bag, it will give me a little bit more height. Like, do you know what I mean? So. <laughs> hey, you know, like I said, you find a way. You find, because, you know what, you're there to do a job and perform and people are expecting you to turn it out. Yeah. So, Ministry of Sound, you get that residency and that starts to help in a big way. And I'm assuming then from there, you're playing around the United Kingdom, right? Or just London more so? Uh, uh, throughout the UK, I guess, like just from doing that, like, and then going to university and just like, you know, I don't think that I, I did music technology at university. I've 
to be honest, I went to university to get away from my family because they didn't approve of me DJing. So I had to like try and like get away so that I could do what I wanted to do, right? So, so can, I play, can I play your father's part right now? Because I, yeah. I can imagine. So what are you planning on doing with your life when you finish uni? Uh, so, yeah, I mean. That's I a question I got. I remember hearing I mean, it. And I said, I said, yeah, I'm going to go and, you know, going to go work in a nightclub. Like, like mansion club? I don't even think my parents even got to that point. Um, what? Like, you You're going to DJ? Them. Are you crazy? No. no way. You'll be broke on the street, right? That's what you're is, No, but the thing is, like, for me, like, being female, being brown, all the things, right? Um, like, my parents were just horrified at the fact that I, I was doing something that they saw as, as, in their mind, it was like something that guys do, right? So, because that's all they've ever seen, right? So they're like, why are you doing this? This is terrible. You can't be out late at night and blah, blah, blah. So they would stop me from DJing. So I had to hide it from, from them for many years. And actually, like, to the point where, like, my brother would, um, like, help me out and he would he, he would take me to my gigs, as I said, right? And I would have to like go in the kitchen and distract my mum while my brother brings down my record box and like puts it in the car and like things like that. We, I had to do that for so many years. And then I went to university and I was like, now they can't say anything because I don't live at home anymore. So I basically, I uh, purposely picked a university that was not too far, far away from London so that I could get the train back to London if I had a gig. Because London is really the place, was the place to be for me at that time. Um, and I studied music technology because I really didn't want to go to university. I studied music technology because I was like, hey, I'm going to do, you know, I want to be a producer. So I'm going to do music technology. And like, I'm still doing the university thing and I'm still, you know, um, so yeah, everything was like, my whole life was like based around like DJing, which is like, I had planned my life around my DJ career and I, and I didn't realize I was doing that, but I. Please search for part two of this podcast on the platform you're watching or listening to. And please do not forget to follow us.